Welcome. Come in. Don't be scared. At least, not yet. Before the car, before the airplane, there was the locomotive, the train. 8,000 tons of steel bearing down the tracks at speeds of over 200 miles per hour. That's a lot of power. And with a lot of power, requires lots of fuel, as train conductor Crazy Bones will tell you in tonight's yuck yarn of a tale. But his train doesn't run on diesel or electric. Oh, no. His train runs on something far more powerful than that. All aboard, we're heading to Ridge Rock Station, where Lost Souls are on sale, and Crazy Bones is dealing. Gather round. Look into the light. Look. Look deep. Open your imagination, and listen to the story called The Tracks of Ridge Rock Station. The soul train shot across Banyan Bridge like a pitch-black bullet, rumbling and tearing through whatever happened to be on the tracks. It banked round corners with hellish abandon, teetering sideways and grinding steel on steel, spitting sparks at tender and brush on the sidelines of every run-down station it plagued. With an engine charged by the souls of the dearly departed, the 187 wouldn't need to stop for hours. The supply had been plentiful lately. It would reach Ridge Rock Station by sundown, and its conductor, Crazy Bones, would make good on old promises. At Ridge Rock Station, on the dusty, splintered platform, sat two men. Elmer Gage held up a bottle of liquid amber and watched the worm inside slowly settle to the bottom. He measured the last bit of sunlight from the horizon through squinting eyes lined in crow's feet as black clouds rolled in overhead, the color of wet ink, amorphous and fluxing. Elmer took a deep swig and passed the bottle over to a large man perched beside him. For Elmer, the station was like an old football injury that wouldn't let up. It flared and throbbed and called out to him whenever he found the slightest bit of courage to leave. In another life, Elmer was somebody, a husband, a veteran, a mason, a sober guy with a lot to lose. The screech of locomotive steel ended that life. He never believed it was an accident. People don't just walk onto the tracks, ignore the foghorn and blinding light, and get obliterated accidentally. Thelma was happy back then. Her mind was sharp. She would never snuff herself out like that. And so Elmer stayed near the tracks where he lost her. 
waiting for answers. T-Bird snatched the near-empty bottle and tucked it tight-fisted inside the cover of his coat, an oil-stained slicker patched with Gorilla Tape and old bumper stickers. He screwed the cap back on his bottle and pulled out a stick of gum wrapped in foil, then motioned to Elmer. No thanks, T. T-Bird glared over to a woman leaning against the rod iron railing of the platform proper. Scratch? Not interested, she said, drilling deeper under her fingernails with a toothpick to loosen the grime, her frayed flowered dress catching splinters on the platform planks. About that time, Gage. You think it'll happen again? Elmer closed the book on his lap with a dusty clap. It was an old, sun-stained Chilton manual for Fords, 1977-79. to 79. I'll bet you the rest of that bottle that it doesn't. T-Bird grinned, an arrogant parabola filled with rotten teeth. Y'all disgust me. Get off my platform and go do your betting somewhere else, over by the rest of the soulless ghouls. She pointed the toothpick across the yard, under the freeway overpass, where a black barrel blazed like a beacon of insidious intent. Trigger, a mangy old St. Bernard, nudged T-Bird's thigh. He unwrapped the gum and placed it carefully onto the dog's drooling tongue. T-Bird stood, arthritic bones and joints snapping in and out of place. The red hawk feather on his black velvet fedora swayed in the arid breeze as he crouched down and took hold of the tracks. He looked back to Elmer, who had opened up his book again. Deal. What do I get when I win? Elmer looked up, disgusted. Uh, you can have whatever's left on the body. In the distance, from beneath the overpass, two figures approached. Levi, the older of the two, carried a piss and vomit stained mattress on his shoulder, rolled up and balanced like a scroll of cotton timber. Following behind him, actually pushing him rather hastily, was Jean, a slick southern boy about 22 years old with eyes the shape and size of mercury dimes. He dangled a jug of burgundy wine that sloshed with each languid step he took across the rock-strewn station yard, rambling on in Levi's ear from behind. Now you just rest yourself right over here, old-timer. Sandman will come along just as quick as you close your eyes. Levi wobbled to the center of the yard until he stubbed his big toe against the tracks. God damn, that hurts, I know. I know it does. Give me that. Jean took the mattress and laid it down on the tracks, placed perfectly across both steel beams with a concave nook right in the middle, where a nasty coil fought to surface. Ah, way to take a load off. Levi's head reeled and spun. His vision was a kaleidoscope dance of spiraling colors and geometric shapes. Jean had prepped him for the grave, warmed him up by the bonfire, and emptied the first half of the wine jug into his twisted bowels. All that was left for him was to lay still on the mattress and count the stars that began to awaken across the darkening sky. The tracks reverberated, a slow stutter that rolled into a cold massage. The deafening boom, like a Valkyrie's war cry, resounded from the eastern end of the station. Jean jumped back off the tracks and watched as the ocular stream of pale blue light, a hypnotic tractor beam, caught sight of the petrified man on the mattress. Crazy Bones swung his corpse-like torso out of the cab, slapping a black, pen-striped cap against the side of the iron beast. He howled at the rising moon, his red eyes intermittently flickering like searchlight signals crosswired. <laughs> Jean trembled with excitement, flipping his callous thumb across a thin stack of crisp green bills, all ones and fives. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. <laughs> G 
Gene cackled. Gene had the wide-eyed look of a kid in a candy shop with a jar full of shiny pennies, ready to devour. Sick son of a bitch, said Elmer. Correction, rich sick son of a bitch, said T-Bird. Elmer gripped the planks of the platform. T-Bird wrapped his forearm around Trigger and pulled him in tight. Scratch flicked her toothpick onto the yard and clung to the railing for dear life. But old Levi just laid there on the tracks, staring up at the stars with cataract-painted eyes. About 50 yards from impact, Levi sat up. The intensity of ghastly light constricted his pupils to dots on the end of a ballpoint pen. An eerie smile slashed across his face just as the train's gnarled cowcatcher severed him into two unequal parts like a brittle wishbone. A red mist shot out and painted Jean's face with warm, freckled droplets. Crazy Bones looked back at the platform as the Soul Train curved alongside the freeway overpass. He tipped his hat and yanked on the steam horn to seal the deal, a guttural, satiated moan. A trail of wafting, sulfurous smoke slithered through the air and the black beast was gone. The next morning, Levi's body, or what was left of it, caught hold of an iron grate that filtered garbage and debris from a murky wash that ran along the length of ridge rock, winding through its underbelly, sclerotized and full of foul things. The folks that lived beneath the overpass were the first to catch a whiff of the Soul Train's meal. A rousing stench of decay rather than the crackling aroma of bacon and eggs. They were a motley crew of vagabonds, runaways, addicts, and throwaways that scattered at the sound of sirens or the sight of flashing red lights on a black and white patrol car. Worldly possessions packed tight into rusty grocery carts, pushed and pulled by trembling hands, jostled around beneath the overpass. Glass bottles and tin cans chimed an early morning jig. Bloodshot eyes peered out from the cracks of cardboard boxes and along the edges of old newspapers sprawled out and stacked high to fight back the elemental sting. Stuck to the concrete walls were flyers with a dark red-eyed figure staring out. Supply and demand. Let's make a deal. Ask for crazy bones. Elmer Gage held one of the flyers while T-Bird rummaged on the tracks for the remains of Gene's sacrificial lamb. Ain't much left of him. You sure I can have whatever I want? Let's see, a shiny nickel, a used water Kleenex, or a ring? T-Bird's eyes honed in on the golden ring wedged between two jagged rocks. Elmer looked up from the flyer. Leave it there, T. It ain't your business. T-Bird yanked back his hand and turned to Elmer. Touchy. What do you care about old Levi for anyway? You stood there, same as me and Scratch, and watched him get plowed. Dumped him downstream, in fact. That's a wedding ring, dipshit. What you know about marriage, Gage? That ain't your business either, Engine. Now you're getting racial, Gage. How about I tie you down to these here tracks like an old spaghetti western? See what kind of deal I can make with crazy bones for your soul. Maybe a new carburetor. A couple bottles of that ring-a-ding flavor. Nah, he'd probably spit you out. Too gritty. Too full of cow shit. T-Bird laughed, and Elmer began to soften. Is this for real? Asked Elmer, holding out the flyer. What's it mean? Supply and demand. You mean you've been here all this time? What's it been, ten months? And you never heard of Crazy Bones? He's a creepy old bastard. Makes deals with the untouchables around here. Some say he ain't a man. They say he the ghost of Casey Jones come back to fill up on souls and ride the track straight back to hell. Bullshit. Go on and laugh, but I seen him. Seen his eyes, at least. 
He's got a whole lot of things in them cars. Precious cargo, he calls it. That's the supply part of the deal. And the demand? Well, hell, look around you, Gage. This ain't Disneyland. Demand as far as the eye can see around here. Folks under the bridge need their fix. Folks on top of the bridge need just about any perversion their minds can conjure up. What did Gene need then? Seemed pretty well taken care of to me. Cash Ola. Ain't a soul alive don't yearn for cash, Gage. Where you say you was from again? Disneyland. A real funny, Elmer. Rocket fuel's ready, said Scratch, leaning out the station threshold. Elmer and T-Bird walked back to the station where Scratch had prepared a pot of coffee on a propane-powered grill. She daintily spooned Big John Beans into her mouth while staring at newspaper advertisements for lunch specials, used tires, and burgundy wine by the jug. T-Bird had found Elmer out on Banyan Bridge, his arms raised up in a V-shape, head held low, gazing down at the infinite abyss below. It was a long walk from anywhere to make it to the bridge, and so a man perched near the edge was a conscious effort, something mapped out and executed, the result, in Elmer's case, of a plan to end his own life. But T-Bird talked him down with a bottle of whiskey and a few dirty jokes. He was a refugee at the station now, a survivor that shook off the natural tendency to pay loss back with even more loss. The innards of Ridge Rock Station looked the same way they had for the last 30 years, save for some slight upkeep and a couple of modifications that T-Bird and Scratch had made. Candlesticks for when the generator died, used kitchen appliances from the five and dime, and new locks for the front door. They fought and made up, split and merged, more times than Elmer cared to remember in his short stay at the station. But they had each other's backs, like two magnets that could either attract or repel, depending on which side of them happened to be facing each other. Magnets, nonetheless. Scratch set up a cot for Elmer in the back corner of the station's main entrance, where folks used to line up and pay for their tickets. T-Bird tossed darts at a board behind the counter of the ticket cage. Scratch flipped through the newspaper still, circling odd jobs with the sharpie pocked in teeth marks on the cap. The station made Scratch nervous. It was home, but nothing permanent in her mind. Her belly had already begun to show signs of the life developing inside of her. She stared at Elmer's hand as he tinkered with a busted solenoid, the white band around his finger a sharp contrast to the rest of his suit-stained appendage. Bingo, said T-Bird as he pulled a dart from the dead center of the board. Still sharp as a tack. He looked at the cracked pine table where Scratch and Elmer sat. Go on ask him then. He ain't gonna bite you. Elmer exhaled the draw from a half-smoked Swisher Sweet and glanced up to Scratch. You mind putting that god-awful thing out? Baby on board here, she said, pointing the sharpie at her stomach. Elmer crushed the cigarillo on the table and stuffed it in the front of his plaid Pendleton. Sorry about that, Scratch. I forgot. That ain't what you was gonna ask him, honey buns. Scratch stared at Elmer's hand again and looked up at his narrowing eyes, slits of cracked jade and regret. Were you married, Elmer? Elmer drew his hand away from the spare part and tucked it in his lap beneath the table. He sure was. Damn it, T. Can I, for one damn time, tell my own story? Scratch held her index finger to her lips. Again, baby on board, Gage. I can't have all that swearing around here neither. T-Bird chuckled. Elmer apologized again and began to speak. Her name was Thelma. We were high school sweethearts, married after about three months. Exactly three months. Had a job with a contractor, real nice guy, laying concrete and patching up potholes out in Brookside. Moved out of a single room apartment and got us a three bedroom, two bathroom condo. She called it 
Shangri-La. Brought home a beagle, a real purebred, not one of those flea-ridden mutts like old Trigger. And we settled in. Damn. Elmer stared above his cot at the clock, a large gold-rimmed Big Ben replica that shot a coil every eleventh hour. Scratch lowered her head and stared. Then what? Elmer rubbed the white band of flesh between his fingers. Then she up and disappeared. If you call what happened old Levi disappearing. Police said they found her car parked a couple yards away from the bridge. Clothes were scattered on the tracks. Found her shoes. With her feet still in them. Up toward the station. Pieces of her. Everywhere. Said it was suicide. But I don't believe it. I can't quite figure out what she was doing all the way out here in the middle of the day. Thelma was scared to walk out to the mailbox by herself. Only time she'd used a car was to pick me up from work or run to the post office or the grocery store. Just doesn't make sense. You think it was Crazy Bones, don't you, Gage? Elmer hadn't thought about it. He drank himself into a stupor night and day, searching for her, rifling through the gravel, dusting off the tracks, wading through the river below the bridge. Elmer had spent every waking hour looking for a clue when all the while, right under his nose, the conductor of the only train that ran the route through Ridge Rock Station could have had the key to free him from the pangs of doubt. I don't believe in devils. Only hell there is, is the hell we make for ourselves, right here. T-Bird took Scratch softly by the hand. They walked to the door of the main station, where T had built his own Shangri-La, and entered silently. The chugging churn of an old generator died out, and Scratch peeked her head back into Elmer's room. I'm sorry that happened to you, Elmer. I didn't mean to pry. Yeah. I'm sorry, too. Thanks for the coffee today, Scratch. Elmer lit a candle with his silver-plated Zippo and dozed off to the sound of train horns in the distance. The hollow knock of boots along the station platform woke Elmer from his stupor. A single candle swayed on the table, casting nasty shapes upon the walls with every gentle push from the breeze of an open window. And in the center of the window, like a pop-up book, was the silhouette of Crazy Bones. Got a light? <laughs> his foul breath snuffing out the candlelight. Elmer banged the back of his head against the wall behind him, swung his legs around the edge of the cot, and grabbed for a short piece of rebar that rested against the shell of a burned-out stove. As he adjusted to the darkness, he saw two red eyes from the window's portal, beckoning. He didn't believe in devils or demons, but what he did believe in was the weight of the iron rebar that he gripped tightly with his right hand. Get! Easy there, soldier. Crazy Bones held up two spider-webbed hands, splayed out like dying tree branches. Just dropping in to say hello, and to introduce myself. Heard of me yet? His fleshless maw clattered with each word he spoke. Elmer slowly made his way to the front door. He shook the knob to make sure it was locked, eyes still locked upon the figure in the window. Bones followed him from the opposite side of the wall, playing cat to Elmer's mouse. Come on out, boy. I only want to talk. I promise. Boots knocked against the platform again, echoing to the far side of the station. The courage to step out into the unknown had never been a quality that Elmer possessed, but curiosity, answers to questions, led him to unbolt the door and step out into the darkness of the platform. 
Crazy Bone sat on a wooden bench that lined the back side of the platform. His cap pulled low, hiding the glow in his eyes. His black duster shed dirt and debris that scuttled across the platform. He pulled a wad of tobacco from denim overalls and gnawed a menacing grin. Elmer kept his distance, dragging the end of the rebar across the platform as he approached. Ain't nothing you got that I want, whatever you are. You seen the flyers then? Let me tell you, the rumors just aren't true, Elmer. Right? Elmer Gage. How the hell do you know my name? Eavesdropping. It's not polite, I know. But I'm just curious. Don't you get curious sometimes, Elmer? Elmer paused in his cautious approach. He stood still, eyes narrowing in the darkness. Where's the train? Oh, you mean the devil's train? A little low on coal lately, stuck up at Banyan Station for the time being. Anyways, I was walking about, posting my flyers, when I just so happened to hear your story through that open window. Heartbreaking. It truly is. What you know about it? Name's Ray, if you were wondering. I know plenty, Elmer. I know a guy like you doesn't belong out here. Desperate lot, these folks. But you're not desperate, Elmer. And that's a curious thing. I also know I'm getting really low on fuel. A guy like you would never make the kind of deal I'm used to. So how about we make a different kind of deal? You mean like the deal you made with Gene? You can leave now. Elmer stepped forward and raised the rebar up over his right shoulder. Gene's dead. Overdosed on whatever junk he shoved inside himself. The money always ends up killing folks. The old man didn't have much soul anyways. Only kept me going a couple hundred miles or so. Now, that Thelma. The one you were talking about earlier. That was one hell of a ride. Purest, most unadulterated fuel I've tasted in a long time. Mm. Elmer lunged forward. Gripping the bar with two hands, he swung like a lumberjack at Crazy Bone's mouth. His eyes squeezed tight in preparation for shards of bone to fly. His torso jerked back, shoulders tweaked nearly out of socket as Crazy Bones caught the bar and flung him to the ground. Ah. Before he could rock back onto his feet, Crazy Bones leapt onto his chest, his fragile skeleton pinning Elmer down with the weight of a small truck. Black smoke steamed from the holes where a fleshy nose had once been, burning Elmer's eyes. Bones leaned in and spoke directly into Elmer's ear. I'm not big on murder, Elmer. It's bad for business. My train only runs on what I reap from deals. If you think I burned up your little Thelma's soul by putting her on the tracks myself, you are sorely mistaken. Look at me when I'm talking to you, Gage. Elmer shifted beneath the weight and turned to face Crazy Bones. His face was a smooth skull lit up like a porcelain lantern. Bones reached into the pocket of his duster and pulled out a shiny gold watch attached to a chain that plunged into the middle of his chest, a whirling cesspool that smelled of rotting flesh. Here, I'll show you, Elmer Gage. He pointed the sharp tip of his index finger at the minute hand on the watch and quickly began to spin it counterclockwise. His eyes burst with pale blue light, and Elmer stared, empty and numb. It was afternoon. Haze hung below the horizon as the sun above blared into the windows of a white Chevy truck 
parked in a turnout just a couple yards from Banyan Bridge. Elmer felt the heat on the tracks and the electric wave that rode upon them. His green VW Bug was parked right next to the truck. A tall man with sandy blonde hair hopped out of the driver's side of the truck and wiped his face with a bandana. He looked around for a moment and then approached the passenger seat. He opened the door, reached inside with both arms, and pulled Thelma out by the ankles. Her head slammed down into the gravel with a hollow thud, and the man drug her naked, limp body onto the tracks. Her sneakers were still tied to her feet. As the train approached, Elmer felt a rush of darkness overtake him. The man ran back to the passenger side, pulled out a handful of garments and a gray windbreaker, and tossed them onto the tracks. He leaned over Thelma and kissed her on the forehead, then jumped in the white truck and watched as the soul train took its fuel. Crazy Bones jumped off of Elmer Gage and stood above him as he writhed and shook uncontrollably. The light in the demon's eyes died. He stared at Elmer with indifference. Now, do you want to make a deal? Elmer crawled to his feet. He was drenched in sweat, trembling at the realization that he had known all along that he was right. Thelma was murdered. The tall man in the white truck had snuffed out her light, made her look like a weakling that just couldn't handle the weight of life. He stepped towards Crazy Bones and held his hand out. Knotted knuckle bones dug into his clammy hand as he grasped, shook, and sealed the deal. As Crazy Bones walked along the tracks toward Banyan Bridge, he paused and swiveled his head back in Elmer's direction. I'd watch out for them. He pointed his finger at the station door. Nothing like new life to make folks desperate. Elmer did not sleep. He worked into the wee hours of the night, ratcheting, twisting, bolting, hinging, welding, patching, and polishing until his work was done. He took hold of the key and turned. Years of pent-up horsepower let loose. Pistons pumped. Pipes cleared themselves with dry leaves and cobwebs. Motor mounts trembled. Gauges flared from right to left, and a stream of black and gray smoke poured from the exhaust of a battered old Ford Ranchero. T-Bird and Scratch walked out to the platform and watched Elmer, his hands glued to the steering wheel, staring ahead with bloodshot eyes. The sun began to rise, and T-Bird held a flattened salute to his brow, blocking the rays of light. As he approached the rumbling car, Elmer rolled down the window, still staring forward. What's going on, Gage? Gonna need your help this morning. Got an errand to run. Need an extra pair of hands. Elmer reached over and unlocked the passenger door. Yeah, sure, let me tell Scratch. It was only when T-Bird and Scratch stood close together, whispering to each other, that Elmer looked away from the wheel. He watched T-Bird's goodbye and pushed on the accelerator impatiently. T-Bird glanced in the bed of the ranchero as he made his way to the passenger seat. A rope, a sledgehammer, the rebar next to Elmer's bed, a bunch of four by fours, railing spikes, and a soiled pillowcase, all laid out and tucked away neatly. T-Bird twirled the radio dial as Elmer punched the Ford across the tracks and onto the road that humped back the overpass. How the hell you get this thing running so fast? Got a deadline. Heard you out on a platform last night. You all right, Gage? T-Bird reached into his jacket, pulled out the tequila bottle. He swigged nervously. Open the glove box, T-Bird. T cradled the bottle with his left and yanked down on the glove compartment. The latch dropped to the floor mat. A thick stack of bills was pushed into the back of the box. 
Jesus H. It's yours. For you and Scratch. It's not a thank you, T. It was gonna be. Till I thought about what the hell I was doing at the station this whole time. It's only natural. You got a family coming, responsibilities piling up. I'd do the same. What you talking about, Gage? His hand shifted to the top of the bottle. No one's gonna miss me, T. All I got is the bottom of a bottle and a whole lot of unanswered questions. But I'm clear now. I believe now, T-Bird. I made the deal for all of us. So whatever you were planning, you can forget about it. It's done. Take the money. And after today, you and Scratch get as far away from the station as possible. I, I, I'm sorry, Elma. I was going to tell you, but, you know, Scratch. Forget it. You're going to square it up with me as soon as we get into Brookside. Elmer Gage parked the Ford a couple blocks from his destination. Acres of condos lined up like bowling pins, ready to be knocked down. Robert Bob Landon was pummeled with a rebar the second he stepped out of his home. He grunted, then fell off the front porch. He was Elmer's foreman in Brookside, the nice guy that had given him the job laying concrete and patching potholes. Elmer recognized who he was the moment he saw the white truck in his vision, his glimpse into the past, courtesy of Crazy Bones. Elmer bound his arms and legs and tied the pillowcase on his head. T-Bird hesitated at first, then grabbed Bob by the ankles and tossed him into the back of the ranchero. There was no turning back now. Scratch's face flushed when T-Bird rolled back into the station yard with Elmer Gage at the wheel. It wasn't her idea alone. T-Bird had wanted the money just as bad. But Elmer was alive, and when T-Bird handed her the stack of bills, she nearly cracked with guilt. Elmer unloaded Bob and the rest of his gear. He handed the keys to T-Bird and dragged Bob onto the tracks pinned down across thick stalks of wood with railroad spikes through his forearms and feet, a missionary crucifix. He looked over to T-Bird and Scratch as they loaded whatever they could into the back of the ranchero. Go on now, Elmer said, waving them on. Bob woke up just as the station's residents cleared out of a dusty rumble of exhaust fumes. You bastard! Do you know who I am? You're done for! Bob screamed from behind the blood-soaked pillowcase. Hey, Bobby. It's me. It's good old Elmer Gage. Remember me? The tracks began to vibrate. Sullen eyes peered out of the shadows beneath the overpass. Elmer? That you? The fuck you think you're doing? Fulfilling my end of the bargain. Supply and demand, Bobby. You ever hear of that? Jesus, Elmer. She wanted it. She couldn't stand the sight of you anymore. Every day, man, every day I gave it to her out by the bridge. And she wanted it. She was gonna jump off anyway. All guilty and shit. The foghorn rang out. Crazy Bones pounded the side of the 187. <laughs> he pulled off his cap and tipped it to Elmer, who walked back to the platform and sat down at the edge of the dusty planks. He pulled out T-Bird's bottle and chugged the last quarter. Trigger sniffed and dug his snout into Elmer's thigh. No! The train's blaring cry muffled Bob's voice and Elmer Gage stared at the white band of skin on his left finger as the soul train put an end to his unanswered questions. <laughs>
Elmer now knows what happened to his wife. Once he found out, he went full steam ahead with his revenge. He didn't even have to cover up his tracks. As for my friend Crazy Bones, his train wasn't running so smoothly after fueling up on Bob. Turns out that even some spirits come in low grade. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tale. Until the next one, won't you stay the night? <gasps> <gasps> <gasps>